teen romance stuff. <laughs> um, and so I said to Julie Fleck, who I'm sure you guys know, she's been my mentor and my Vampire Diaries, the original. She runs Vampire Diaries, the originals, Legacies, um, and directed our pilot. Yep. 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 Um, but she, uh, she's a really good friend of mine, and she gave me really good advice. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to reboot Roswell. Um, she was like, go and pitch the version you would want to do. Which for me meant they were grown-ups, and there were cowboys, and <laughs> it was political. Um, and the plan was I was going to go in and pitch it, and the CW was going to say, thank you so much. Bye. We're going to find like someone. We're going to yeah, find totally. someone who wants to do the teen, the high school version of the show. Um, but the plan was that at least then they would know what kind of stuff I wanted to do. So that in the future, <laughs> so then in the future they would bring like more me ideas. Um, and then they bought it at the table. And I just like pitched this crazy thing where I was like, and they're 30, and there's a high school reunion, and like Trump is in power. <laughs> and I, I literally like they legitimately were like, okay, so we're doing this. And I like looked at Julia with this like panicked look on my face, like, oh, I have to actually make the show. <laughs> um, but that's uh, I mean, it's it's the most me version of something that I can can say. You know. I, I hear everybody when everybody says that they don't want to do, that they're not into reboots. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm excited to do it. I feel really like, I feel like it's really cool to get to kind of play in a sandbox that mattered to me when I was a kid. Right. Um, and to be honest, the original cast and team has been really, really wonderful to us. I mean, everybody's reached out, everybody that you can think of except for Catherine Heigl from the original. <laughs> <laughs> She's so busy. She's so busy. She's not reaching out to her children. But like, but like, you're right. Like, 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 this is really important from a creative standpoint because Julie told you, like, don't pitch the version of the show that you think they'll buy. Pitch the version of the show that you want to make, which I think is really important creatively. I think it actually applies to anybody's life because I think a lot of times we're kind of suss out like what people expect of us and what they might want. And to go in and say, I'm gonna pitch this with abandon to my own creative standards. I'm gonna walk into something I, I would actually be excited to make, fully expecting they don't, they're probably not gonna want to do something meaningful or important. Um, I think it's a really like important life lesson. Like you shouldn't be trying to figure out what people want. You should be living like fully in your own space. Because if you pitch a show you hate, and then they buy it, you have to make a show you hate. Yeah. You know. But you got to make you. You're making the show that you really wanted to make. And I think that like people don't really realize like I don't have a life outside of work. Like this is my entire. You life. have a life outside the of work. People. Yeah. <laughs> I see have you. you. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I, it's all on Instagram. Um, like, I, but that's like that's what I work all of the time. My brain is always on work. So if I was working on something that I really hated, it would just be like actual torture, right? Actual torture. And I'm so proud of this project. And right. like, I really feel like we're making something that that matters. And then like, it's the first thing that's out there that's like mine that has my name on the front of it instead of Julie's. And I really am proud of it. Yeah. I, um, I also want to say that I wonder how you feel about the fact that you might not have been able to sell a show like this five years ago, that there's a there's a cultural urgency right now to the themes of the show, um, and you guys, when you, we're, we've got some content for you later that you'll get to take a look at. We're going to show you that trailer. We're going to show you some footage, it's amazing. But uh, I've seen the pilot, and I think what's exciting about it is it is edgy, and it is pushing against the boundaries of what's going on culturally now, but it might not have felt as urgent four years ago under a different president. These themes feel meaningful, and then you've been able to kind of swaddle them in like the sweetness of like, you know, like a rebooted, you know, high school romance. So many almost kisses. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that I think it would have been uh, yeah. I mean, I think it would have been hard to sell a show when the, like this when, when the world wasn't you burning. Feel good about the world that I would have written. Like when I when the world wasn't burning, I would have been cool to write the high school version of the show. Oh, you know, yeah. but like the, I feel I feel like there's an urgency to ask smart questions. That's what I'm trying to do with this show. I'm not trying to like preach a certain political standpoint. I have my own opinions, obviously. 
Um, yeah. But, but yeah. I, 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 I like smart conversations with smart people, and I want this show to feel like a smart conversation with smart people who are not necessarily on the same side on every single issue. Mm -hmm. So the show, we're trying to ask questions and to humanize issues. Humanize issues. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, make things... We're, we're talking about alien metaphors, but we're also talking about literal, undocumented... Aliens. Well, well, yeah. what, what we, that term that yeah. we've used for people who are undocumented. Undocumented people yes. and also aliens. And like, we're really living in the, like, it's not a fictional president. You yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. And the theme of xenophobia, which was really prevalent in the first, in the first series, this idea of like the other, right? Yeah. Fear of the other, fear of the unknown. It feels so much more grounded in the fact that that's all we're talking about right now is that there's some threat from outside that we think is going to kill us, and a lot of that fear is manufactured and manipulated fear. So one of the great things about this show is that your character, Janine, is just the badassiest of badass girls. She doesn't need to be saved. She gets saved, but she doesn't need to be saved. She gets shot. Like you need to be saved from being shot. Spoiler alert. It's not a spoiler. Um. You're the worst showrunner ever. <laughs> I'm I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you're amazing, but still, secrets. Um, but I, I wonder, you know, um, both of you have done a lot of work in television, and you've read a lot of pilots, and I wonder how you felt when you read this pilot, because this character is just, she's not fucking around, which I love about her. So how did you feel when you read the pilot? Saved. <laughs> Honestly, because pilot season um, is a insane, weird beast, and I, I I I got new reps at the beginning of this pilot season, which you know they're like trying to show off and be like, you made the right choice. So they send you like ten pilots, and you read all of them, and you go like, what actually sounds like it'd be delicious to me? And I I'm, I'm gonna say this to like turn blue in the face, but there was a line in this pilot that immediately convinced me I needed this job. Um, Liz is talking to someone, and they say something to her, what is it, it was like, um, uh, you're being so, what was it, it was like, you're being defensive? so... Defensive? Defensive, yes, defensive. She's like, they're like, why, why are you being so defensive? And she said, I'm a Mexican-American woman in 2018, I get out, oh no, it was, I get out of bed in the morning, um, I, I'm defensive as soon as I get out of bed in the morning. Something, something along, along those lines. lines. Mm -hmm. And I just thought... Oh my God! This woman feels me, and like feels what it is to be a woman, you know, and especially a Latina woman in, in 2018, and to be looking for something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it just she it rolls just, her R's in this. It's just like the sexiest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Because my, <laughs> we have a character. My sister is Rosa. Rosa. <laughs> and I think I had like one take where I forgot to roll my R's. And she's I like, made her come back in her ADR. The, the Rosa. We were the Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it was totally that idea. Mm -hmm. It was just reading that and going, um, as artists, you're just you're you're lucky to work, mm -hmm. but you're blessed if you're working on something that like fires up your soul. Yeah. And this, thank you. <laughs> and um, and this was just something that I thought, let's just go for broke. And I, I was working on Grey's Anatomy at the time, and 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 that that made pilot season even more difficult because I would. Just at, at whatever day I had a half day, I would run in and you know try to read for what I could. And um, yeah, this was this was our like long shot. This was our like dream. This was our dream. Yeah. Dream grab. And yeah. um, it worked out. Yeah, it worked out beautifully. I just like when so I got legitimately run over by a car right in the beginning of pilot season. Guys, this is not exaggeration. This is not an exaggeration. Like, like fully, like, I'm like, Karina was walking her dog, and a guy came around the corner, and Don't she could see that drive. the guy was going to hit her dog. Oh, so okay. she dove down to grab her dog, and as a result, the car hit her in the head. Oh. Oh. This is not a high prickly. Um, and so, also, Karina is such a badass that she's like, I just got hit by a car. No big deal. And we were all like, ah! Fine, I'm fine. You're like, we're like burning our own belongings. 
Oh, Stephen Miles running naked through the streets. You are. Really you can call Stephen and be like, I'm dying. He's running naked through the streets. You'd be like, Stephen, it's my birthday. He's running naked through the streets. It's the same response regardless of the situation. He didn't help you in any way running naked through the streets. He helped me running naked through the streets. But he didn't help you running naked through the streets. Um, but the reason I say this is because I was legit. I wasn't there for Janine's audition. All the other the other EPs were there. I was legitimately in the hospital. And you were actually really struggling to find this woman. Like you had a very specific well, vision in your head. They had all said like the casting directors were like, we're gonna have to hire a whole other team to just find a Latina woman. And I literally was warned, was warned. It was like. You might have to just cast a white person in No! I was legitimately yeah, so like, if, if, if we cannot cast a Latina woman in this role, we don't have a show. Yeah. And I was fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there was just... And the video, the tape came in of Janine's audition, and Julie said, I think we found her girl. It was like Janine and like five other girls that auditioned on the same day, so they sent me the tape of everybody, and she was like, I don't want to say which one it is, but I think we got her girl. And I seriously watched seven seconds of Janine's audition, paused it, and emailed the rest of the team from the hospital. If you let her go, I will kill you all. <laughs> anyway, she's fine. Everything's <laughs> fine. We're all fine. She's fine. Her dog is named Pacey. Pacey's also fine. Yes. Pacey's fine. also fine. By the way, like Josh like, Jackson's also fine. If you're wondering about Josh Jackson, he's also fine. He's fine. So he's super fine. <laughs> super fine. Um, I, I, I want to. I want to get to know that. But one of the other things I really. Think, but like, let's not. But no. <laughs> that's it, right? I just want. I want to ask you one more question, which is, um, you know, you're playing this woman, and in this pilot, one of the really exciting things about her, and I think it's one of the things that's different from the original Roswell, is that she's she's relentless. She's yeah. really saving herself in this pilot. She's finding yeah. things out on her own. She's a grown up. She's an adult. She's a scientist. It, it's such a different approach from the original, which was like a lot about kind of mystery and like romance and these secrets, which is like, she's like, you know, you're not keeping any secrets from me. I'm not interested in a relationship where there are secrets. And I wonder, you know, a lot of kind of modern television is starting to trend towards self-sufficient women, but there's still a lot of like, you know, Oh, the car almost hit me, and then you stopped it. How did you stop right. it? Mm -hmm. And then what? Tell me what. And then there are people like me who just hit the car. car. <laughs> you stopped your car with your head. Um, a superhero, <laughs> Captain Marvel. Um, but uh, I wonder if, like, when you were making the pilot, how? I mean, I, I, this is a dumb question because I feel like these things were easy to play for you. Was there anything you struggled with in this pilot or in this material? Because it feels like it would have been really natural for you to play. I mean, she's just a badass. I love you so much. <laughs> um, you know what it was? It was, um, this is my first time uh, being the number one of a show. And what I realized about somebody who's a protagonist is that the part of the reason why we're on a journey with them, especially a journey that has like this much action and sci-fi, is that, that they're heroic. Mm -hmm. And almost kisses. You know? And uh, almost kisses. Lots of almost kisses. kisses. All the almost kisses will do. I mean, get to it already! <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I did a lot of I did a lot of research on that. I worked with my acting which <laughs> was just like your heroic characters. <laughs> you just pour the giant <laughs> up. <laughs> so I don't know. Jimmy is strong. Jimmy is trying to talk about like adult things, and I'm like, here's the one. <laughs> continue, continue, please. Um, <laughs> This is literally the best panel you've ever done. I just want you to know that. I mean, you don't know that now, but you think that was the best panel I was ever on. Let me continue. Honestly, this is my first Hong Kong, and it's like. Yay! embarrassment of rituals that I have these two to like shepherd me around this funny fucking crazy town. Oh, you yeah, might die tonight. You might die tonight. Just be ready. You might uh, also perish. Yeah, totally. I'm so, I'm like so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you don't be part of your account. Yes, ma'am. Um, big city. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, so I, yeah, I was just like thinking a lot about being heroic and how particularly she's an investigator. Like, she, she's a scientist. She's in, in, in on the side of investigation. And, and she doesn't stumble. Back. Like your character never stumbles over information. She's oh. actively looking for the answers, which I guess yes. relatively new again for a mm. female heroine and a female heroine in TV. Yes. And you're like, oh my god! You're like, wait a minute, this is fucked up. I gotta yes. get this out. She's so thorough and everything. And that was one of the first things that Karina told me, which really helped me get into Liz. Was she's somebody 
who really asks questions and who really listens to answers. Mm -hmm. And I thought, fuck yeah, like absolutely. She hates a fake answer. She hates a fake answer. Mm -hmm. He tries. He tries with her. He thinks. He tries, he tries to smolder. He tries to smolder you. You know? Right? He's like, I'm gonna smolder you into confusion. Crap! I'm so like smoldering here. Totally. And I love that about her. It was just like it was finding the way in which um, she's just like that 10% more um, awake and more like you know brain power than yeah. all that all of us wish we could be. So you're seeing it in her, and you're going like, oh yes, if I if I could have just. Lifting my spine just two more inches, like she just did in that moment. Right. So it's really inspiring me. So, like, yeah. I'm not that type of like, I look like a dog. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you'll see this. I, I, I don't want to spoil the show, but you will. See, we have some material for that we're going to show you at the end of the panel. So, Liz and Max were high school sweethearts, and she's been gone, and she's she comes back. To town. He, it, it's not so much they were high school sweethearts. Because they were friends, like, like, he was just like. Pining. Yeah. And pining and pining. And he's that small town guy who's got a mortal <laughs> heart and he stays because he cares about the place, but there's also but he's also got roots that are holding him there. Um, how has this role been for you to play? Because one of the lovely things about Max is that he's a very moral guy with a very big secret. And that's a really interesting dichotomy, right? A guy who is honest and upstanding and good, who is lying to everyone. So how has that been for you to navigate as an actor? Well, it's always interesting when you when you start to explore loyalty to a fault. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you get to that fault point where you, you want to protect the people that you want to protect, you want to protect yourself, and in the process of doing that, you end up hurting every single person around you, mm -hmm. and just causing more damage than you could ever have thought to begin with. The, all the damage you tried to prevent is suddenly just coming back at you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's been it's was really fun during the pilot to to really explore kind of where that line is, especially when Liz comes back. All of the secrets that I've been hiding, all of that stuff just comes bubbling out, and I can't help it. And I destroyed ten years of a carefully crafted house of cards. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really fun to to reach that breaking point. It's a little bit of a Sophie's Choice for your character because you can either tell the truth to the woman you love or tell the truth to your family. And um, and in the and and in the end, I think everybody's faced a, a dilemma like this, right? Like, you know, right, like we all have to tell people we're aliens. <laughs> we do, and we all have to have sex with our. I was in a pod for fifty years. I, I sleep in a pod every night. That's why I look this way. I'm seventy nine. Um, but, but I mean, I, the, the, like, what's great about the show is it is like metaphors for real, tangible issues that people have. You're, you're trying to navigate an honest life, but do lies protect the people you love or do they endanger them? And that is really the question because by protecting her, you're endangering other people that you care about. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Let me just say, I, I, we got to do something, I, I, just, I sang to names praises, but like, I had Nathan in mind for a different role on the pilot and we brought him in, literally like, I, I like texted him, Nathan and I are old friends. And I texted him. We worked together on the originals. We worked together on the originals. We were really close. We're like we've we've been friends for a long time. And so he's in the mix for Michael, who like I was just like, yeah, that's totally Nathan can totally do Michael in his sleep. And sometimes he has to work in his sleep because it's hard to get rid of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Guys, he, but, but, were but, but I couldn't I could picture Michael really easily. I couldn't figure out who was our max. And we had like a a whole parade of incredibly talented actors come through for Max, and just like what I, I just didn't feel like we had the guy. And literally one day, we had one guy drop out of the the test because he got another pilot. And I texted Nathan and I was like, "You can memorize shit fast. Can you just come in and test for Max?" I was like, "You're not going to get it." Which <laughs> <laughs> is a really fun thing to have as an actor. <laughs> you like work really hard on making this great, and then you're I was like, just learn some lines. But... I'm like, you're not going to get this role. You're not. You're not right for the thing. Can you just like come in and do you lines in front of a bunch of white guys in suits, but then nothing's ever going to come of it? <laughs> and like, Nathan owes me a thousand favors, so he did. <laughs> and he came and he came in and he like did his Michael Michael audition and like went like changed his shirt and like came in for Max. And we got to do something, like, basically the 
the head of the network saw Nathan's Michael audition, Mark Pedowitz saw Nathan's Michael audition, and yeah, and was literally like, that's a leading man. And I was like, no, he's not, that's Nathan. <laughs> And he was like, that's a leading man, that's your guy, that's your guy. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I didn't, I, like, I'm, and then I say this, like, like, nobody believes in this guy more than I do. I've been a huge, I'm a huge fan of his work and I loved writing for him on the originals. And I still was like, okay. But I think because, but, so he was, he, he has, you have a roguish quality that makes you, that has always made you like the side guy, like the eye draw, right? Like, he's, he's the romantic the complication. Guy. He's the guy who runs in and ruins everything. <laughs> And like, I obviously there are a lot of fans of the originals here of the original show here in the audience, and that makes me so happy. Nathan brings something different to Max than than we saw in the original show because there's a purity to Max in the original show, and there's like this this innocence and this morality that is just so essential to who he is. And Nathan brings a weird, dark, broody, like troubly thing that, and I think that it made. The, I don't like saying nice things about you in public. But but Nathan brought something to the show that I think sold the show. Yeah. I really do, and I think that we wouldn't have a show if it was anybody else because we were able to do something with you and that turned things around at the end of the pilot. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you'll see it. That wasn't really in the script but that Nathan brought and I feel incredibly lucky to have these two as the, the leads of the, the show because I think that like I write things and I think that like that's that's how it is right like I wrote it and I'm the genius that's behind the wall and all that She's and I am so <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think we would have a show if we had any other actors in these two so I just wanted to say and I was, yes, absolutely. We're talking about like, climate, like political climate, social climate, and why this show is so relevant right now. Yeah. But I also think there's a, a third climate, which is creative climate, which is where we are in terms of scripted shows. How much more dimensionalized and flawed and, and frail and human characters can be on TV than they were when the first Roswell was on TV. They were, they were, they were, those characters were much more archetypal. Right? Here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, here's the beleaguered sister. And now what we have is a guy who is trying to do the good thing and realizes that like that's not an empirical truth. Right? The good thing for one person is not the good thing for another person. He's and, and his heart is split. It's not head and heart, it's heart and heart for us, right? And I think again, we all can relate to that idea of like I, I we say this a lot, I say this all the time, like love is not a love is not a finite uh, a finite resource, right? Like, oh, you love your mom, so you can't love your sister, or you love your kids, so you can't love your lover. Like, that's ridiculous. But in loving more than one person, your loyalties can be incredibly I divided. You. Thank you, that's true, because I'm the most lovable of all your friends and all the people in your life. So other than me, do you know what I mean? Like, what's so exciting about this show at this time is that these characters are trying to do the good thing, and that thing is constantly shifting and morphing and changing and evolving. Um, tell us a little bit about making the pilot. Um, you guys shot it um, in Burbank? No. Where did you shoot it? Albuquerque. Oh, Albuquerque. Where did you go? Yeah. 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 My yes. car got stolen by a meth head. Oh, <laughs> 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 To be honest, like the pilot was really—I really loved shooting it. It was stressful. We, you know, a small budget, and though we know a lot of time, but um, <laughs> we bonded. I mean, I feel like we, you know, Nathan and Janine and I had a, a an opportunity that you never really get with TV, which is like to really sit down and like I had, like sat with these guys and turned the pages of the script and was like, here's the daddy issues that I poured into this scene, and here's the fight with my ex-boyfriend that I poured into this scene, and this is the feeling that I was trying to get across here and like 
we all talked. We, we literally like had dinner. Like we, we made like nine hundred pasta dinners. That's we all so gained so forty good. pounds in Albuquerque. So but that so that's not. It's not a luxury that you have yeah. mostly when you're work, when you're doing TV because you're in such a rush. Um, and we had that luxury because Julie Pleck made us have that luxury, and also because like we were friends before. We were, we already like. We made a shorthand already with each other. Yeah, Nathan and I worked together really well on the originals. Like, we, we have a good creative thing, and Janine just slotted into that so, so seamlessly. Um, I don't, Mike, Mr. Michael Trevino is also on the show. Oh, I don't know who doesn't love Michael Trevino. She's like, she's like made of cheekbones and abs. Um, but he, but, but he, he was family for Julie and I, too, and so it was like, and Eva, who's sitting in the back over there, is uh, one of the writers on the show, one of my best friends, and has been in the Vampire Diaries world for 900 years. Um, it, really, it really felt like we were making this show with family. I mean, our A camera guy was Jeff Schutz, who was like, we worked with people that we loved already. And so bringing in new people, it was easy to fold everybody into the, into the family and to really talk about, like, every single part of what went into this. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to be a showrunner. It's a new thing, but like, I've told these guys, like, there's an open door in the writer's room. You wanna come in and listen to us? You wanna like, hear how it starts and hear us say dumb shit all the time? Like, yeah. come in. Like, writer's rooms are just dick and fart jokes all day long. <laughs> and luckily, our so culture is changing, so there's a lot more vagina jokes than there used to be. But it's so my mom, weird. my mom came to visit the writers' room and was appalled by everybody. Adam Lash is sitting in the back. He's also one of our writers, and he was like, making, like he was like pitching a gimp mask in front of my mother, <laughs> which was a pleasure. Nice, he was just like Saturday night, nice guys. I'm gonna get a gimp mask. How's it look? <laughs> anyway, so there's a gimp mask and the show. <laughs> We've got we've, we've got a fantastic fantastic team, but yeah no I just I wanted the door to be open and I felt feel like the door felt open from the beginning in Albuquerque. I don't know. Did you guys have a terrible time? <laughs> it was no pressure, no pressure, no pressure. I mean I've done I've done eight hundred pilots in my life. <laughs> Not a lot of gun. <laughs> One, it's gone. But that's that's, that's the life of an actor. Right? And that's the life yeah. of an actor. And it was amazing to me because Julie Plank is a, a monster. She's absolutely insane. Like she's a force. I don't know how she does what she and does. Like she works her ass off and also like parties so hard and is the last one awake. Oh, like, I'm trying to sleep. It's four thirty in the morning and she's outside and I'm like, Julie, I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> rest. She's like. You're late. But then she shows up in the morning and she's like, here's how it's all gonna go. Yeah. She's amazing. And she just the ship just felt so so intact. Everything was running so orderly and like she she said at one point to me she just felt like in a moment of frustration, like, oh my god, pilots, like what is this? Like you are establishing a show, you're establishing connections. With Max and Liz, it's like not only is there expectation and is it this this you know great love but also it's it's 10 years you're meeting them with they've known each other for their entire lives and they haven't seen each other in 10 years it's a lot of like life that's been lived in those eyes you know and and julie turned to me and was like i just feel like this is madness and I, I was like no girl this is amazing like this is i've never been on a pilot that has felt so together like yeah. so cohesive and um yeah, that's a testament to you guys, like all you crazy originals, vampire people. Like you, it was amazing. It was it just felt so good to feel taken care of, because then you just are ready to do your best work, and you know there's time. There's time to figure things out, because everyone's got a short hand. Yeah. It was a dream. It was a dream. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, I'm, this was definitely by far the most collaborative project I've ever been a part of. Yeah. Um, you do a lot of shows, and if you're a guest star, you're, you come in late in the season or whatever, you're just told where to go, where to stand, what to say, what to do. And you don't really, you're just sort of thrust into it, and like, oh, okay, I'm here, like, let me, let me, I'll do a good job, I promise. <laughs> um, but this, from the beginning, was very much a, a, a group effort, I feel, a team effort. I mean, like, you read, like, the first draft of the pilot that yeah. I wrote, so you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a long time. Like, we spent Nathan, a long how did Cowboys talk? Can you fix this for me? Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's a left front running light? How do you hold a gun? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that. Nathan is the man stuff consultant on the show, in addition to the man stuff. Official title. Man stuff consultant. 
Um, um, but, yeah, no, it just felt, it just was like. really collaborative. It was a, just so great, and that comes from the top. Comes from great energy. A lot of wine. And this is super giggly, but I do want to explain a little bit to you guys. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are con veterans, so you've heard people talk about the creative process and what it's like. Uh, but but I want to like do a little juxtaposition. So um, a film is 90 minutes long and typically takes between 40 and 90 days to shoot for 90 for 90 minutes of film. A television pilot is 44 minutes long and you have to shoot it in eight days. So we had half. So yeah, they had a lot. But of also money. only 42 a lot of minutes. <laughs> yeah, 42 minutes in 12 days. But you know, comparatively for a film that's not even twice as long as that, you're getting you know seven or eight times the amount of time. So a pilot is incredibly compressed, and you're trying to create a world for people that they're going to fall in love with. At first, you know, when you see a new show, it's it. You watch the pilot. If you love it, you watch the show. If you hate it, fuck it. You're never going back. And the pilot is typically not ever the best work that's going to be done on a show because it's everybody trying to find their tempo, trying to find their dynamic. And then there's a bunch of assholes from the network going, I don't know, I don't like his shirt. Could it be green? Could it be blue? I thought it was green. Now it's blue. Are there Cheetos on this set? And they were creeping around making it insane. Um, I mean, I'm not talking about Cheetos. I'm talking about like, people in suits in general. And so there, there is this pressure because you are, you are launching a show and it, the crucible is this 42 minutes. Um, so the fact that you guys already had a really great working relationship in the beginning was really important because it could make or break a show. Yeah. And if we've all watched the first pilot of a show and go, this show sucks, I'm not going to watch this again. And then your friend's like, I've been watching it for weeks and like, it sucked. But yeah, you have to give it six episodes. You're like, bitch, I have a family. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give it anything six episodes. I hate when people are like, just like get through the first season and the second season is great. I'm like, what the fuck time do you have? Like, bitch, I eat and walk pacey. <laughs> Get right over my car. Tell me, this is the word, this is my, this is my stupid Comic Con question. Tell me something funny that happened. Uh, <laughs> Michael Glamis. Michael Glamis. <laughs> yeah, tell me about Michael Glamis and his hair that has its own, like, orbital relationship to the to gravity. <laughs> There's, I don't even know where to start with this guy. He plays Michael Yeah, Michael. My little room. He's a gem. He, I mean, we're so lucky we stole him before he got famous, because he's going to be so famous. You guys, he's going to be so famous. <laughs> I told him the other day, he was like, should I get a publicist? And I was like, you don't need a publicist, you're gonna get all the talk shows. I was like, Nathan will be on the billboards, you'll be on the talk shows. <laughs> oh, 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 rude. Rude, it's true. He does like to talk. <laughs> so, so, Michael Guerin was my favorite character on the original Roswell, is my favorite character on the new Roswell. I love him so much. How rude. Much. I'm just like, I, you're talking they know. Like, we, they know. know. We, know. we know, we know. Um, I, I love this character. He's a, he's a foster kid who like got dealt a really shitty hand and is trying really hard, but I dealt a really shitty hand. And when I tell you, he's like broody and cowboyish and works in a ranch. And he's like, when we first meet him, he's in jail. And totally your type. <laughs> Brooding, jail, foster kid, communication skills, too much air. Stop laughing, Nathan. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes. Um, but he, he, Michael Lamis could not be more different from this character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is like this cool Chicago kid. He's like, Woo! so excited. China. China. Oh, oh. He's just like, he's, he's so fun. He's just the best guy ever. We love him so much. And but he comes to set, and all of a sudden he's like, in his zone. <laughs> he gets so sexy Just on camera. I don't so understand. It's what what we all the sit in the universe. universe. If there's how? alien stuff happening on our show, it's how Michael Blanus becomes so hot on camera. It's <laughs> so weird, you guys. <laughs> Literally, weird. like, we're sitting watching these, like, takes, the, these cuts of the pilot that are, like, so long and so bad, and we're just like, oh god, we don't have to show, and then Michael Blanus comes on screen, we're like, <laughs> um, but anyway, we love him. We did a. It was his birthday while we were while we were in Albuquerque, and we decided to throw him a surprise birthday party. And Nathan's like, I am going to. Nathan's like, I got this. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell him I want to play pool, and we'll go we'll go get pool. We'll go to we'll go to this like pool bar that we we liked. The rest of us are like, we're cool. We're gonna wear our flam base. Flam base is his fan base. We made it up. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the party, guys. But like, we're literally like, okay, we're gonna show up with this thing. And Nathan's like, I got this, I can do this. And I was like, Nathan, he's never going to believe that you want to hang out with him. <laughs> he doesn't like people. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and Nathan's like, no, I got this. I'm being a joiner. I'm like, participating. He's like, I was like, he's like really taking being like a leader of a show very seriously. And <laughs> we go, Nathan invites Blanus to go play pool. They go play pool. We surprise them. We're all excited. We're like a whole thing. And Blanus is like, I really thought Nathan just wanted to hang That. I was like, Nathan, we've been friends for five years. You've never asked me to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole season to rectify this situation. Yeah, sure. We did play pool, though. Yes, so yeah. we went. Because we, we were hiding behind a, a like a, a wall in this bar. Like, is this, should we have to watch your Should we? Should we, should we, we like scurry. They're, they're, they're taking the nine ball. They're taking the nine ball. Get in there. Get in there. Yeah. Um, well, we, we love Lana. You guys are going to love Lana. Get a massage or something, right? Yeah, we'll do something. Dude, dude, yeah. Just, just yeah. like dude yeah. shit, like couples yeah. massage. Perfect, yeah. Some like cowboy stuff. I probably call his mom about that, too. Pictures, pictures where it didn't happen. We all love his mom. Before we show you guys something from the pilot, but before we do that, um, I just want to hear from each of you, having made the pilot, and you started actually shooting the pilot, and you started actually shooting the pilot, the series? No. Not no, yet. not yet. We start like, uh, next week. Next weeks. week. Okay. All right. August thirteenth is when we officially roll camera. We we have, <laughs> we've done the thing. So we got we're, we're in touch. So you know, you make a pilot, and and much like uh, Karina's experience with pitching a show, where you're pitching the show you want to make. Um. A lot of a lot of the beginning part of the series is about expectation, right? This is what I love to do. This is what I want to do, and you're kind of hoping you get to do it, but you don't know that you will. And then you make the pilot, and it gets ordered, and then all of a sudden you've got permission to make the show that you wanted to make. Uh, and it's different. It's a different set of permissions because that first pilot is about packaging, you know, this this set of ideas into something it's palatable sell. and saleable, which is very different than the kind of rule-breaking stuff you get to do when you get ordered to series. So I just want to know, without giving too much away, what your plans are for this season and, and what your hopes and expectations are for your characters going forward. Karina. Um, the, the scaffolding of the show, the, the structure that we're building around is a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. um, and we are telling a story, a, a love story and a murder mystery tangled up all together. It's pretty dark. It's very dark, but it's fun dark. Uh, yes, yeah. juicy dark. It gets darker. Ooh. <laughs> Nathan and uh, Lily, who plays Isabel, came into the writers' room the other day, and Nathan was like, "It's dark." I was so happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it gets it gets kind of dark. We're we're pushing. We're trying to push the boundaries. Um, we're trying to ask important questions. Yeah, and. Uh, we don't need another show about teenagers getting fucked up and having sex. I mean, I don't want to be rude. I'm just saying, we, we've done that um, Yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're trying to ask important questions. We're trying to sell a really fucking epic romance. And like, I mean, these two, like Nathan got the job because of a chemistry read. That, that was what, what ended up being the thing was You're like. like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let me say that to and like a backpack for the finish line. <laughs> um, the, the network, like, like, legitimately, like, I've seen, I've seen Nathan do really, really, really good work on the originals. We, I, I saw the chemistry and I was like, I just, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know. We brought it to the network and like, with Laura Terry, who was an executive of the network, we're in this big screen room that looks like a movie theater, that's like a huge screen, and the, the, the chemistry read ends, and Laura looks at me, and there are just tears streaming down her face, and I was like, I guess Nathan's Max. <laughs> and I, I literally, I like, get in my car, I get in my car at the end of the day, I call Nathan, and I'm like, well, you're Max. <laughs> but they're just crying, and I was like, oh, okay. And I, but I also think, like, like, that's another thing about TV, is it can't be manufactured. There's, a, there's, there's an alchemy to TV, there's an alchemy to art, there's an alchemy to television and film, which is like, you've got a bunch of disparate pieces that all are good, and then you put them together and you get something magical that you couldn't have anticipated, and I think there's that's really some magic happening. It's a, it's a magical pilot, 
Um, it, I it, feel, I feel, I, I, sorry to interrupt you. No, I go. feel, I'm just singing your praises. Like, like there is this, like, I feel, I say this, I say this a lot. Like, I don't like the word lucky because I work my fucking ass off. So people are like, oh, you're so lucky. And I am exhausted. Not lucky. I work my fucking ass off. There was luck involved in what we did on this show mm -hmm. because there was like a weird magic that I can't really explain um, and I feel incredibly lucky. Mm -hmm. I never feel lucky. I literally am always like what I have is because I fucking s stole it. Like <laughs> I just I just like crush people on my quest. And but this was I feel like there was a little bit of a little bit of magic happening there. Yeah. Not even have any to make it. We all know, like, when you're on a set with someone, you've got to make something magical, right? You've got to kind of, and then when shit's just happening and you're like, wee, you know? know? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Give me that's mic. Um, yeah, we had, we started with the, the sort of like, you know, magic hour. Epic, kind yeah. of. That was like day one, day one, day two. Day one, it was like, you turned your own love and you've been in love for 10 years, yeah. go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice like, epic romance, go. Yeah. Um, it, it, was, it was really, uh, it was amazing. I mean, we were we were shooting in New Mexico, which is also like a character yeah, show. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 was, that was half the magic right there. I mean, it was just New Mexico. Yeah, and we just, we, we were, we were, um, we had like our little video village tent, which is where you know, like the, the monitors are, and the director, and um, Karina, and Eva, the whole team, and, and they were like far off, but like not that far off, like we could hear them. And we were in the middle of a table. We were, so no, they, were, they were pretty far off. They were, we were just pretty far off. Like, we're like, okay, let me, let me at least set these tapes. So, they come out of a cave, they're on the side of a mountain. Spoiler alert. Down the way, there's a video village tent where it's like, me, Eva, Julie, our DP, Michael Trevino, who showed up on set every single day because he's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> right. just like, hey, what do you guys up to? You guys I've you never guys loved a human like I love Michael Trevino. You guys making TV? What's up? And yeah. we're in this we're in this video village tent and we're shooting an almost kiss <laughs> at sunset. Where it's like, I'm not kidding, it's like our DP is making like the the flare from the sun go from her mouth to his mouth, so it's like they're not kissing, but the sun is making them kiss. Yeah, they, these two are just like trying to like not like like breathe on each other weird. Like <laughs> they're just like, what did I give her? What, no, what did I just give her? Like they're just like trying to keep their shit together, and we are screaming in video village like, oh my god! And then like, hey, guys, can we just do our Jobs. No, we honestly, we, we didn't know whether it was like good screams or bad screams. <laughs> <laughs> like, we were in the middle of this like very intense moment, like eyes, eyes, you know? And there's just like orgasm noises coming through the other and you're like, is that good? Well, should we just stop and we suck? We suck, we should just call and try again before the sun goes out. We had no idea. So well, I think this is a perfect moment to see yes. what's going on. Can we kill the lights? And we're going to see the very first. You see all the like broken versions where there was no, no I did, but no, I, I, I watched it this time. Then it is, it is a romance, and it is a murder mystery, and it is a show about people who feel isolated and excluded trying to find a home for themselves. And I think that's something that we can all understand, I think especially where we are as a country right now, culturally, this is a show about people who are hiding a secret about themselves to protect themselves and the people that they love. It's a really beautiful story, it's a really intelligent story, it's fun, it's scary, it's dynamic, it's 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 one of the smartest pilots I've seen in a long time. Um, in the little bit of time that we have left, are there any people in the audience who want to ask a question? We're just gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna come out, I'm gonna come out, I'm gonna go here and then there and then I'm gonna oh, hang out with Jack Sparrows, buddy. Uh, so, what's your question? My question is, because at first I thought maybe there were some episodes already filmed. So where is the rest of the series going to take um, take place or be filmed? Will that will you go back to Albuquerque? Mm. Yeah, I mean we're we're uh, we're going to Santa Fe, and um, we're kind of taking bigger over. restaurants. Yeah, bigger <laughs> restaurants, beautiful. Nathan mountain. loves the Santa Fe. I love it. I love it. He's so like, look at his turquoise belt buckle. Show him. Show him. I'm already doing it. I'm home. 
Yeah, and you guys already said you moved, you moved in, you yeah. got your production offices, you guys got this list, so that's what it's going to be. Yeah, we haven't, yeah. Shot, we haven't started shooting yet. We're, uh, our stages are in uh, Santa Fe. We love, we're, we really love New Mexico. We're, we had a really great time there at the beginning. Um, we are shooting our small town in a place called Las Vegas, New Mexico, which is about an hour out of Santa Fe, and it's this like really cute little town that was like basically all built in the 1800s, and it's just like, like when I was there the first time, like texting me from the internet, I'm like, this is your place. Like every store is like, this is the hat store, this is the boot store, this is the other palette, this is the belt buckle store. Like, what else do you need? Come on. No, no one needs to eat, just belt buckles and hats. Okay, who had a question over here? Hi. Christopher Chan, got your horse spritz on your line season 13, episode 5. Sorry, this is I love you, but uh, questions for. Sorry, I can't. I love you, but I love you. 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 I for Karina, um, I know the importance of the relationships between Max and Liz, but what other themes from the original series are you bringing into the new series? If anything, are you throwing it all out? Are you bringing some other themes, relationships? Um... Can we talk about Michael? <laughs> I think that the, I think that the, um, the themes are where we are actually really honoring the original series. Themes and the music. We got a lot of 90s music, guys. I've been writing like, I've been writing like tweeting love letters to every 90s music. Like, we're going after Goo Goo Dolls hard. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I wrote a, a love letter to Adam Dreitz of the Ken Crows, who, who really fucking shut up for us in the pilot. We don't have big And he's totally so. available, guys. He's actually right outside. <laughs> um, that and then, and then Stefan Jenkins of, from Third Eye Blind, which is ever, is like basically giving us one of his songs for free. Um, he's amazing. Ever, so, last night he's music, one. No Dido yet, but we're working on it. Um, but I think that the themes of, of, the idea is that like when you're in high school and there's a, a sense of feeling alienated and everybody feels like an alien school and that's sort of where the the first series touched my heart a lot because I felt like an alien in high school. I think we all kind of do. And I think that in the original in, in our, our version and what I was trying to do was just grow that theme as far as like I think that feeling like an alien as an adult is a little bit scarier. And I think that feeling like an alien as an adult in this particular era is extremely frightening in a way that I don't know that I really could have understood in high school. Your world gets bigger, you know? Your world gets bigger and your world, world gets a little scarier. And I just want to tackle the questions. I just want to try to understand both sides of most of the well, and also, like, the idea that, like, when you're in high school and you feel like an alien, you think uh, it's going to get better. You think, yeah. I'm going to get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow up and then I'm going to figure this out. It's just because I'm a kid that I don't understand what's going on in the world. Yeah. And then to be 25 or 30 and then think, shit, I still haven't figured this out. There's something wrong with me that I still feel so alienated. It must be me rather than the world that's problematic is a really scary, uh, you know, question to, to contemplate. But I know not because I'm magic, but because I just know what it's like to be a fucking human being, that you hit 30 and you think I should have my shit together by now, and I don't, and I must be the only fucker in the world who hasn't figured this shit out yet. And I think what's great about this show is it's people contemplating their humanity uh, at a time in their life when we all think you should have figured it out by now. And, and being um, presented with this otherworldly discovery, like this immense hope that all of this ridiculousness does exist at that age is amazing too, right? Like think. your foundation's shaken. Yeah, like you're just going like, what? I mean, you know, the, the expanded possibilities is amazing to me at, at that age. At, in the second episode, we kind of tackle the idea of like religion. We, we tackle this, this idea of like, if, alien, if, you, if you're confronted with actual proof that aliens exist, what would happen if you were confronted with actual proof? proof? hard proof that God exists, like you're waiting for it, you know? And I, I think that we are using this show to ask those questions, and what if, the what if of it all. Mm -hmm. And a bigger, I think a bigger set of what ifs maybe than the first show, right? And we're just sort of a different time. 
Yeah, it's a it's a different it's a different time. Yeah, you look great. Things were good back then. <laughs> For once, <laughs> there was a Clinton in the White House. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, <laughs> also, that's how I greet Aisha every time I see her. I'm like, bitch, selfie. <laughs> Uh, so I, 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 you brought up a couple times how you guys are dealing with immigration and political issues and stuff like that, and I think that's really admirable. My question is, I think that there's a couple of ways, like, some, it's really easy to make the other viewpoint the adversary. How do you feel like you guys handle that? Is it kind of like there's a black and white, or like a, we really want to understand, look at it from both ends, you know what I mean? That's a very good question. I mean, okay. We had this conversation this week because um, I, I'm, I'm part of this amazing group called Latinas Who Weed, who are just women. Latinas. <laughs> <laughs> I brought Portos, which is a Cuban bakery to the yeah. office. And yeah. she had me say that. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's great. But um, we, we spoke about that at our last meeting. It's actually arousing for me. And we were talking about. Um, pitching in our last meeting um, and uh, it's just a group of women in the industry who are Latinas who are just going like how can we consciously um, do a good job on our respected shows you know Melissa Fumero, Brooklyn Nine-Nine and you know Gloria Calderon Kelly on Netflix is one day at a time she hosted uh, this last yeah. time it's like a, just a gorgeous room but we spoke about how there's such a desire right now just such a need for undocumented immigrants' stories from their perspectives on television shows. And so I, Karina and I had a conversation about it, and um, what I'm really excited about is that Liz is a first generation, you know, Mexican-American, but her father, Arturo, who is played by this wonderful artist named Carlos, who's a local New Mexican actor, and I love him to pieces, he's an undocumented character, and that's something that our, our brainiac writers are doing, and like showing him, and showing his story, and so, it's not the stress of like, I have to honor every perspective. It's Ellen DeGeneres just existing on the landscape. It's Laverne Cox just existing on Orange the New Black. And that's what we need right now. We need these stories from any perspective, just fully presented. And that's gonna be our, our beautiful Carlos. Without apologies. Uh, we're, we're working with, we're, we're working with a group called Define American, which is a uh, really fantastic group. Our, my, my friend Miguel over there, is uh, one of our writers who is, is really like deeply working with this group called Define American that is uh, helping us tell stories that uh, further progress as opposed to uh, hinder it, you know? I, I just want to add though um, that without giving too much away, there are, there are nemeses in this show, there are adversaries in this show, who see They're the aliens all white dudes. as, as <laughs> but but I but I will say that they their 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 perspective is sympathetic mm -hmm. because um they see they see the aliens as potentially threatening and they may or may not be a threat and I think that while their perspective is is amplified and exaggerated and and hyperbolized um, it's not foundationless. I don't think, again, when I was talking about the original Roswell, that there was like the good guy and the bad kid and the girl in distress, that this shows much more nuanced. Even that dynamic is nuanced as well. I, have, I, have, I wouldn't take it as an analogous metaphor for immigration in this particular case. It is just that they've seen, they've taken one bad incident, much like people look at one bad incident with immigration today, one, one guy does something bad, and then all immigrants are bad. And I think if you're a part of any excluded group, um, you'll understand this. Um, I'm gonna give you a very simple analogy. If um, a white guy does something crazy, that's a crazy white guy. If a black person does something crazy, black people are crazy. And if you think about it that way, that we've had, they see this one incident and they infer that all people like this are bad, rather than that's an individual who did a bad thing, they're not bad people, but they've made a bad set of choices. I people people you, you don't see this like you my my family's my family's Muslim. I was raised Muslim. I was raised I went to Islamic school on Sundays when I was a kid and like I look like I look. So I hear a lot 
um, of people say things that they probably wouldn't say in front of somebody who looks yes. a certain way, who looks different from me. They say stuff in front of you not knowing that you have a, a, a Muslim family that right. has your family I from. wrote this show as an allegory, as a metaphor for Islamophobia, and I wanted to, you know, I fought, actually, I actually fought really hard to cast our three aliens as white people because I really wanted it to be that secret. Like I feel, in high school I felt like I had a secret, that I was secretly Muslim because I'm this blonde blue white person and it was, you know, a post 9-11 world and I wanted to cast white people in the roles of these aliens because I wanted to tell my story. I'm not trying to tell anybody else's story except for mine. Um, but the show is, is, is in a metaphor for Islamophobia. It's what it is. And we're also like living really in a world, in a, we're living in the present, so we're living in the world that we all exist in, and the, you know, Twitter madness that we all wake up to every single fucking yeah, morning. Day, yo. <laughs> and I think that I, I just like, I want to ask questions. I have really, really good friends that are more, a lot more conservative than I am. I have a friend who worked in the White House up until recently, and at the, this White House. This White House. This White House. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying very hard to understand the way that fear motivates people, and the way that fear morphs into hate, or that fear morphs into ignorance, or the way that fear morphs into action. And I want to understand it, and I want to ask the right questions, and this is what I'm trying to do with the show, is like start conversations, and. Maybe finish some conversations. And I think at the core of the question about the, the, the old alien question we've all seen in all these narrative shows, which is if people find out that I'm an alien, they're going to they're gonna take me and cut me out. They're going to dissect me. Well, that's a metaphor for um, if, if people find out I'm different, they're going to dehumanize me. Once they see that I'm not like them, I'm not human, I'm subhuman. I can be dissected. I can be dismissed. I can, if I'm subhuman, maybe I don't love my kids the way that you love your kids. So if you take your kids away, my kids away from me, it doesn't matter because you don't think I love my kids the way you love your kids. Mexicans don't love their kids the way that Americans love their kids. Their kids are just offspring. That's, that's the conversation at the core of this show, which is can we see the human in everything and everyone? Can we see the human in these aliens? Can we see them as fully developed, fully human, fully complex people with feelings and emotions and connections who deserve to be protected, who deserve to be self-determined? And it's it's a brilliant show um, that I really hope that you guys will watch. I hope you guys will watch. Isn't she like so cool? Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us. We'll be drained a giant carafe of rosé. Um, thank you so much for coming.